Welcome to my basement, my archives. A lot of history in those boxes. A lot of journeys and a lot of work. Most of it required big negatives. Because um, we used a view camera with a claw. Here's a perfect example. This is Orson Welles. Nineteen eighty-five. This is the size of the negative. It was near the end of his life. Orson was leaving the studio and he was in a wheelchair at that point. And in the loft building in Los Angeles, I was looking down the staircase and a shaft of light was coming in and illuminating Orson in his wheelchair looking at the door. And I didn't have the courage to make the photograph and intrude on his life. So that picture exists here and it never goes away. Never. Orson. I try to be an equal. Even for those few minutes, it's just I'm a human being and the subject is a human being. And if the two of us collaborate together because we want to make something special, then you have a great portrait. If there's resistance on one side and negativity, it slows down the process and the picture becomes, or the photograph becomes more ordinary. So how do you connect instantaneously? Scorsese, let's find Scorsese. I guess Marty's hiding in here. Where is Marty? Marty. Look at Marty all these years ago. Wow. And here's Marty, he's acting. Look at that. So he's giving me that. He's playing the actor. Boy, is he there. This is a great picture. I haven't looked at this one in years, but I think this is great. Because it's not perfect. Because it's moving and flawed. And there's Richard Nixon down there. Okay, who else? I actually photographed Paul Newman a whole bunch of times. I think this is what they used on the cover of the Times. He looks like the hero, doesn't he? Here was the picture we wanted to use at the Times, but the editor wouldn't let me use it. This was my favorite picture of Paul for the cover. See, he would go and he would play, and that would make the great portrait. You see his eyes? I love this picture. I think they thought they didn't see enough of him to know it was Paul Newman. is he? He doesn't have to do anything and he's cool. So 
So these are very early photographs from the Himalayas, the Tibetan border in the 70s. Yeah, 1979. 1979. It's a flawed photograph, but if you look at the monastery in the lower right-hand corner, you realize the enormity of the mountains. So India, Nepal, Tibet, all these places, that started in 1974. But at that time, it was, it was too early in my um, understanding and development to, to put all these pieces together until I had the crisis with my arm and I turn to yoga. to work was a constant, never-ending pursuit of perfection and excellence. As a professional photographer and then a portraitist, some 40 years later, the travel, the 14-hour days, the pressure of concentrated, sort of intensified, stressed-out sittings brought me to a surgeon's table to fix calcified nerves in my neck. When I came out of the surgery, my right arm, my camera arm, was totally paralyzed. The neurologist looked me in the eye and told me I would never use it again. I could have accepted this injury and resigned myself to living with a disability. But somehow, instead, I decided to choose a different way and shifted all my intentions in a much more positive direction. To learn to sit with myself, to calm the fear. early on that I would concentrate on making rather than taking photographs. That I would strive to make some sort of emotional and spiritual connection to all my subjects. That would transcend the medium and become something more. The pursuit of spirit in a two-dimensional image became a theme through the whole project. In a sense, I've become an anthropologist.
This project has occupied a 10-year chunk of my life. The photographs have been culled from different time periods, different attitudes. I remember to bathe in the Ganges with 70 million people during the Kumbh Mela festivals. It's 11 years now almost. Yeah, I okay. remember 11 years before too, I think. Yeah. And we walked, you, let's go. Yeah, walk. we walked all the way, like 12 kilometers. Look at this beautiful rock. And they have taken a lot of time to come into this shape. It took time. And someone, few things helped him, this to become beautiful. It's not even possible that the whole world turn into Babas. You need to change the lifestyle only. Your thinking. No one else is responsible for their unhappiness. You have to think over that. What makes you unhappy? And I think the main cause behind it is his never-ending desires. He's always busy, you know, to fulfill them. And he's doing so much for this. He's going this way, that way, this way, you know, doing efforts. Sometimes he's success and sometimes he's not success. When he's success, even then he's unhappy. When he's not success, even then he's unhappy, you know. So you have to limit the circles of your desires, you know? You understand? Cut the list of your desires, make it shorter. And I think you can get satisfaction. It's a kind of process, you know, you have to go through. If you asked me about yoga 20 years ago, I... Could have just answered a normal answer, you know, oh, that's something people do. Makes them feel better. It's good for the mind, I guess. The connection came after I got injured. And rather than living in the injury, I chose to set an intention to overcome that injury. And the first thing I did was turn to meditation. Then I became, then I became really fascinated with yoga. It works very heavily on the nervous system and my nerves needed to heal, so it helped. 
But along the way, the curious child that I was, or the boy that wanted to know about things, just became super fascinated and wanted to start to meet. I mean, if I could go photograph these presidents and I could photograph these great directors and I could photograph leaders of countries and I could photograph, you know, the greatest opera singers in the world, why couldn't I go photograph some yogis? And how come nobody's paying any respect to the great minds of yoga? And that's where it was born, the whole project. So it gave me, it gave me a ticket to get to the greats. It opened the door. It was one of the highlights of my life to meditate with some of these masters, to be educated by them, to be blessed by them. from India sick every time. My Brazilian wife would say, no mice, Michael. But I continued to go back for eight more trips. I remember nights in the Himalayas sleeping with the Sherpas of dirt floors when it was 30 degrees or less inside the room. guides, translators, assistants, and drivers under rough conditions. Where do you say? Is it the only way to go? feel the sense I. It is actually the first thought that arises. It doesn't arise as a thinking thought, but it's your natural sense of self-awareness, the, the way in which you, you know that you exist, when you feel the feeling, I am, I exist. But this I exist feeling, somehow it gets identified with the instrument and believe I am the body and started to embrace the conditioning that arose in the body as though that's what it is. And so we call that uh, the fall from grace or the first misunderstanding, ignorance creeping in. No one chooses fear. Fear is the result of something, an earlier idea that we are merely just this. So we go through life with that conditioning that I'm a, I'm a man, I was born in this place, I'm this age, I am I'm a lawyer, I'm a painter, I'm a singer. We are this also, it's just part of who we are, but we cannot be defined merely by the body. You're infinitely more than the body. 
and infinitely more than the mind may suggest to you are much, much greater than that. thousand years before, Vedanta was, Upanishad was taught only in forest. Only those who have a real thirst to know, they, in search of this ultimate knowledge, go to forest. Because in only the forest, the mind remains pure. And most of the Mahatmas of this ashram most of their time is being spent in this boundary only. Less connection with the external world. No desire, nothing, no more needed at all. So this boundary itself is forest for us. for longer period, our mind gets calmed down to that level so that it can further penetrate into the depth of our own being. Now we are getting ready to know that we are something different from our body. Who am I actually? Everyone is seeking happiness. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, the essence of the Vedic literature, as it is said, when you water the root of a tree, that water naturally extends to every leaf and every branch and every flower in the tree. So when we actually find the origin of our true pleasure in feeling the infinite sweet love that God has for us and in realizing our potential to love God, that love naturally extends to all living beings. When we forget that, then we're on an endless journey trying to find it somewhere else. But the nature of life is, eventually, we realize that if I can't find that happiness within myself, I'll never find it anywhere. And that's where real, true yoga practice begins. When we understand the flickering, temporary nature of this world, and we understand the beauty of it, Kermok in here. 
my teacher, Grimmook, who I've studied with for some 12 or 13 years now. And uh, I asked her where she wanted to be photographed, and she picked the Golden Temple in Amritsar because she's a Sikh who practices Kundalini Yoga. And the most holy place in the Sikh religion is the Golden Temple. I love this photograph of her because she's so at peace meditating by the holy waters and the temple. We all breathe if we're live human beings living on this earth. So the way you breathe is the way you live. Breathe a longer, deeper, longer, deeper life. But if you do quick little breaths, you'll end the life quite quickly. Right. But if you take your breath up to that one minute breath, the life can be so much longer, richer, freer, more conscious. The quality of your breath is the quality of your life. It's as simple as that. But you have to walk the steps yourself from darkness to light, to your breath. You have to live in the world, but you have to know you're not of the world. And that you bow every morning to that creative force within you. Most of the world is still looking outside themselves for their truth. And there's many gurus, many spiritual teachers, but beware. If a teacher wants a lot of money, if a teacher wants to initiate you as his students with no hope of ever becoming a teacher yourself, I would say run. Those are the olden days. We all have to be teachers now. Yogi Bhajan would say, never die a student, die a teacher. Maybe not of yoga, maybe of photography, maybe of art, maybe of math. But turn around and say, come on, I might know something that could help you. Bert, I was some loony bird when I was a hippie, but I knew. It's like Bob Dylan's song, you know something's happening, but you don't know what it is. How many people can get away from Anything that's polluted, any place is pure, so few can. But you can sit. The whole world is inside of us. I believe that we can turn this world around. I believe it's not too late. I believe that. Otherwise, I would not be doing what I'm doing. The young people, some are waking up. I have great hope for this human race. Photographing is, in a way, a meditation. Complete focus. Certainly working in the darkroom is, too. But the thing is, there are lots of things we do in our lives where we focus, where we become aware. I was a hippie. I was a hippie. I wasn't completely out there, but I was a hippie. I mean, I started working in the business in the mid-60s. I had long hair down to here and a beard and a mustache. I wore bandanas. I thought I was a hippie. It was cool to be a hippie. <laughs> I guess it's kind of cool to be a rapper right now. It was a fantastic time to become a photographer. He'd be in the dark room and you'd be listening to the burbling water, because there was always running water. <laughs> and red light. 
and there was usually a radio on. So, you know, Jonathan Schwartz would get on the air and he would say, oh, we have a new, uh, a brand new Beatles album just came. So I'm going to play Abbey Road for you for the first time. And you'd be in the dark room listening to the first time Abbey Road played on the radio in America. I guess every generation looks at the time that went by and it'll never be repeated. But that time period, that coalescence of spirit, of music, of writing, of resistance, of change, that was a pretty big moment in time. Most clearly emphasized and, and recorded by Bob Dylan. In a sense, the change. Times are going to change. John Sarkowski um, created the term the decisive moment for a photograph made by Henri Cartier-Bresson. And that started this awareness of the moment that hung in the air. So, yeah, if you're not here and focused dead on, how do you make that photograph at that specific moment when it needs to be made? It's a, it's a decision. If you don't make a photograph that you're responding to, sensing, feeling, seeing, at that moment in time, it's gone. The same way when I exhale this breath, it's gone. create health is by yoking ourselves. Yoga teaches us how to yoke ourselves, ourselves being all of us, not just our physical body. Yoga is not just a physical exercise. When we're practicing yoga, we're able to um, connect with our inner feelings with our thoughts. It's difficult sometimes. Look, we're in New York City. New York City gives us challenges because there's so much going on here all the time. I would say in that balance between the positive and negative, there is consciousness. Consciousness is between the inhalation and the exhalation. So being in the moment, they talk about being in the moment, but there's no such thing, there's only consciousness. And it's our ability to be able to hold on to consciousness that we realize ourselves. Because as you know, the yogis can take time and extend it. And it's, that's yoga. That's the purpose of yoga, is to reach self-realization. But, you know, as long as we're in a physical body on this physical planet, we are always going to have challenges. And if we can embrace those challenges and overcome our difficulties, then that's where we're going to find peace. You know, it's not what we go through in life, but how we go through in life that makes all the difference. Long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, 45 years ago to be exact, when I was a freshman in college, I got profoundly depressed to the point of being suicidal. And there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. 
And uh, my older sister had studied yoga with Swami Satchidananda. It really helped her. And so my parents, who lived in Dallas at the time, uh, decided they would have a cocktail party for the Swami. This was in Dallas back in 1972, or January of 72. It was pretty weird back then. Even today, it'd be weird in Dallas. And uh, in walks this kind of central castings uh, idea of what a Swami should look like, long white beard, long saffron robes. And he came into our living room and gave a satsang, a lecture, and started off by saying that nothing can bring lasting happiness, which I'd already figured out, which is why I wanted to do myself in. But I said, well, what am I missing? I'm ready to kill myself, and he's glowing. He went on to say what probably sounds like a new age cliche, but it turned my life around, which is that nothing can bring you lasting happiness, but you have it already. And that the real thesis of yoga is not that you get your health, your well-being, your inner peace from outside yourself, which is what our culture often teaches us, but rather we have it already. And then the question becomes, what am I doing that's disturbing that, as opposed to how can I get something that I don't already have? It may sound like semantics, but it's all the difference in the world, because if your happiness and your well-being are what you have to get, then it's like, how can I get what I don't have? And then everyone has power over you. But if the question becomes, what am I doing to disturb my own inherent health and well-being? That's very empowering, because that I can do something about. If the light is already there, and it's being obscured by the darkness, and the guru, the remover of darkness, literally guru is remover of darkness in Sanskrit, a real guru helps you identify your own inner guru, that we all have that. It goes by different names in different spiritual traditions, the, the inner guru, the still small voice within. It's the voice that speaks very clearly, but very quietly. It wakes you up in the middle of the night at four in the morning, go, oh, now I remember, you know, because it, it's drowned out by the chatter of everyday life. Listen to that inner voice. And so at the end of a meditation, I'll ask myself, what am I not paying attention to that I need to? What am I not hearing? And so ultimately what these techniques bring you, whatever spiritual tradition that you begin in, they all kind of go to the same place, of that on one level we're separate, you know, you're you and I'm me. On another level, we're part of something larger that connects us, whatever name you give to that, because I'm more inwardly defined and I can see the unity underlying the diversity. The paradox is that the world becomes much more of a playful, uh, enjoyable adventure rather than a problem to be solved. The universe is one, the univision is one, and the universe is alive. And if it's alive, it breathes. And if I want to participate in the universal dialogue, I participate by consciously playing with my breath. So yoga works. And so you're supposed to come in in one state, and hopefully if it does its job, you come out in a different state, right? A state that is designed, right, to um, give you more joy. But the goal of practice is really um, to develop a discipline so that that sustains you, so that you can always get over it, so that you don't have to walk into the room in a bad mood and have that experience put you in a better mood. When I think about yoga for joy, when I think about the spirituality of yoga, the metaphor that really speaks to music, right? And yoga is music. It is the body's the instrument, the mind's the musician, your breath is the tone, and you play music, you learn music, you listen to music to soothe the soul, to soothe the personal soul, to soothe the collective soul. I think in some funny way, it's, it's a vision for how we could live on this planet that sometimes we're listening to, and sometimes we're not. You know, how, how willing are we to stop judging and stop comparing and stop analyzing and start to just have an experience of what's moving through us at any given time? because what's moving through us is a longing for love and connection. And we keep blocking it with all these thoughts 
and these, these mental meanderings that mean nothing. The, the spirit that is moving through us already, it's not something we have to add, it's not something we have to go to class for, it's not something any it. teacher can give to us. Right. It's moving through us already. That is what we're, what we're glimpsing and touching during yoga when we practice, and hopefully when we're not. I think yoga stands for freedom for a lot of younger people. It's a way out of the system. It's a way out of feeling trapped or forced to be a certain way or live a certain way. Uh, it's a way to understand who you are and what you want and to live that. Most people just aren't aware of it because they're stressed out, they're afraid, uh, and they're running around like a crazy person just to survive. And it's this is a hard world to survive in. I get it. Um, but as, as yogis, I think it's important to say there is enough for all of us. It's okay. When I photographed all of these different schools of yoga or teachers from different lineages, it wasn't that I was trying to record it all or the difference between the yogas. It simply was that I was trying to tell a visual story about what yoga looks like. How it's practiced, who the teachers are, And in a sense, often it didn't matter if the asana was perfect to me. It was more the energy and the intention of the asana in the photograph that I cared about. I could take great teachers. I could take students. It was where they were going, what was the intention of the asana, and what was the energy of the picture. Yogananda Ji in Rishikesh. He's like a root of an old, old tree. You don't know whether the root of the tree is coming or going or holding the rock together or the rock is holding the tree. And if you look at part of the picture, without his face, you can't tell whether he's a root or not. He loved being photographed there. It felt like a, an appropriate place to tell a story of age. When I made this picture, he was uh, 98 years old, or so he said. He's since passed. I think they say he died when he was 106 years of age. But pretty remarkable to do this at 98. The journey never had a specific destination. It was simply my own personal path with yoga. That path was a river, and the purpose was to be on the water. I hadn't been back to India for quite a number of years, but the Ganges, Ganga Mata, was mother to me. My energy flow through my relationship with yoga. It often felt like rafting, like river running. I would put in and float, drift, pull the oars, never knowing what was around the bend.
And then at some point I would take out and the flow would become its own meditation. Sadhus uh, who are not doing sadhana, just only smoking. But the, the another thing that it doesn't matter because you renounced everything. You're you're done. You know you have nothing. Just that smoke comforting you. And sometimes that smoke can uh, uh, lock your sex power. You press it down like control it. There are, that's the thing, you know, finding yourself is difficult. Serving others, you can find yourself. Karam Yoga. Karam. Oh, yeah. There's Bhakti Yoga also, where you serve others. Bhakti is not just uh, Bhakti with an idol. Bhakti is uh, serving. Because you see that one in you, I serve you. You see that one in me, so you serve me, we serve each other. That understanding, no? So that is Bhakti, is real, real Bhakti. That way, you just cannot walk by when somebody is hungry or thirsty, you have to do something about it. That's real bhakti. Devotion. You want dharma? Yeah, hey, let's talk about dharma, because dharma makes me happy. Dharma wanted to show me poses. And, and I was standing near dharma, and I turned around and here he was standing on his head, balanced on the rug in the studio, with his hands by his legs, and, and he was perfectly balanced right on the tip of his head. And it felt like, he, he, he felt like a, he was showing off in a beautiful way, but just showing me what he could do. It was sort of like maybe one of his favorite poses. So we designed 
to do that specific pose on the streets of New York. <laughs> Nothing's retouched in this picture. It's absolutely as is. So he would look at me and he would give me a little signal with his eyes and he would move his hands straight up to his pants and I would make the photograph. I've handed the picture to people and they've turned the picture over thinking that this was up. So I thought it was kind of wonderful in designing the book that Anatina Kessler, who designed the book, decided to take the front cover, which was an upright yogi, and put on the back cover upside down an upside down yogi. So the book is upside down, the yogi's upside down. of all the religions is to give an individual an experience of their origin and they generally agree that our origin is spirit and therefore if you like the job of religion is to give people the experience of their spirit that is always there but it just may be dormant. And that's what yoga does. That's why this, the yoga studios are so full. Because the yoga studio gives a person direct experience of their own inner light, and it lights that fire for them. And then there's a direct line towards wherever that person is and infinite consciousness. Now, of course, infinite consciousness resides within anyway, but we usually take an outer journey to make the inner connection. But in that sense, yoga is uh, not aligned to uh, religious practice in the same kind of a way. It's much more informal. And that's one of the reasons why it attracts so many people these days because so many people these days have seen uh, religion and have seen uh, those who espouse religion behaving in ways that they don't consider religious, they don't consider spiritual, and we're all trying to make sense of these new times. It's interesting to note the uh, difference in approach between uh, Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy. So Western philosophy is essentially uh, an academic pursuit. Discussion, um, uh, written work, exposition, more discussion. In the East, the philosophy is taught through practices that open and elevate the consciousness so the person has the experience of the concepts in that philosophy. And in that sense, yoga is philosophy. But through discussion, you don't actually learn to engage energy, to engage spirit. Ludwig Wittgenstein, he said, our life is a dream, we are asleep. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. So your body-mind is a dream, and everything you are experiencing through the body-mind is also a dream. What is not the dream is the self in which the experience is happening. Your deeper self has no form, because if it had a form, we'd be able to see it. Being formless, it is not in space-time. And being not in space-time, it is also eternal. As the Bhagavad Gita says, you know, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, um, fire cannot burn it. It's eternal, it's not subject to birth and death. That 
self is not in the body. The body is an experience in the self. The mind is an experience in the self. The universe is an experience in the self. Your body mind has no substantial reality. You don't have the same body mind that you had even two months ago or five minutes ago or five seconds ago. In fact, there is no body, there's no mind and there's no universe. These are just concepts that the self creates the human self creates uh, to interpret intermittent streams of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts, which are the only subjective experience we have. The Buddha said this lifetime of ours is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. So everybody's grasping, clinging at something that you can't... How do you grasp space? Forget the air. How do you grasp space? How do you grasp time? Illusion is giving permanence to something that flickers in and out of existence. And the body-mind is like taking a photo of that. If I went to the ocean and I took a photo of the ocean, this wave, this seagull, this rainbow, and I said, this is the ocean, you'd say, no, it's the photo of the ocean. Let's go see the ocean. What we took a photograph of doesn't exist anymore. So everything other than this second doesn't exist. And by the time I finish my sentence, it's a dream already. This morning is a dream. One hour ago is a dream. Five seconds ago is a dream. One second ago is a dream. It's gone. I think in the end, the meaning of life is to find out who you are. Because uh, nobody knows who they are. And they confuse themselves with, uh, with a photo of themselves. And the ultimate goal of life is to find out who you are and therefore go beyond the reason that humans suffer. Not knowing who they are, clinging and grasping, fear of impermanence, identifying with a false self and the fear of death. Those are all one thing, not knowing who you are. So the meaning and purpose of life is to find out who you are. I just want a picture of the eyes. That's it. Beautiful. So I think what we want to talk about is your story. Where do I start? <laughs> At the beginning. At the beginning. Well, I'm Swedish. I was born in Sweden. My father was a chief of police and very, very strict. So by the time I was 18, I, I left home and on the pretense of going to England to study English. And I went to England and was free for the first time and didn't go back home for, for further studies. And from then on, I started uh, moving around in our world. <laughs> so I left home and then I started just wondering what it is all about, you know, what is it all about? And slowly, slowly started growing. And then I was very lucky 
because of my age now, I was in England in the late 60s and 70s. There was a kind of revolution against amongst the young people. There was a hope. So I kind of went with that flow. And then my husband, the father of my two children, he sort of swept me away to India. <laughs> and the first time when I flew, we came to Bombay. And the door opened to the airplane, and I knew I was home. The children had a very nice upbringing and a very simple living. Then we divorced, me and the father. And he went to live in America with big dreams. And uh, I also had big dreams, but my dreams were inside by that time. You know. I wanted to be rich, but in here. He wanted to be rich out there. And so it turned out to be. I guess to what has happened, that's how I think in, in Indian philosophy, you know, you get born with your karmas. And then I feel that when I think back of it, it is like my childhood and my growing up time was paying back karmas. And when that was done, the flight to India, there was a new, new freedom. <laughs> What has happened to me in my life is nothing to do with me. I could never, ever, ever have dreamed or fantasized or planned or anything that my life would turn this way. We are living in a world of duality. There is good and there is wrong. Right. I mean, good can't be without wrong and wrong can't be without good. But you still have to choose the one that is honest. Honesty is the most important True. thing. Truth. There has to be a big change. From any point of view, from education point of view, from medical point of view, from political point of view, from every point of view. It has to come back to being human. What are we doing as humans? Cheating each other so grim, isn't it? What are we doing to each other? If I try to change it, sure I can change it and it can be better or it can be worse, but really, finally, the only thing I can change is myself. Words are not necessary. Words only goes to the five senses. As that much can you talk about and can you think about. You have to go above the five senses. That's where reality sits, that's where truth is. You can't talk about it, but you can feel it, you can see it. Very often, I just sit and try to, to kind of look deeper and deeper. Thought comes. And every time thoughts come, stop them, stop them, stop them. There are so many different kinds of meditations, but I find that for me that has been very helpful of stopping this, not the thinking, all thinking, but that kind of internal, that duality conversation one has with oneself, that thinking. You sort of chat to yourself and you decide, yes, no, I don't like that. And do you, should I do that, do I like that? It's like two people. That thinking, but the thinking of contemplation and of, of widening yourself, you know, that gets much more space then for that. If you stop that kind of planning and planning one has to do, but that extra dreaming and fantasizing and all that, that is the thinking to stop, not the one that brings you further and further. And that heightens the awareness. The awareness that sort of common man don't have because they don't try to find it. It's there. But you have to go above the five senses and above the material world in order to see the truth. Once you're there, then you realize that, gosh, we're all just human beings. 
But until you get to that point, then you are important, and that one is bad, and that one is great, and that one is silly, and that one is rich, and that one is poor. Finally, when you go above the five senses, that kind of thinking, intellectual thinking, then you see that it's just one thing, all of it, nothing more. The guide, not the language, not the words, not the intellect, the eyes. So use just your eyes and you will get that. We will get that. We use the eyes together and we get that. Yoga is union. That union is not outside of us, inside of us also. We need that union through yoga, not mere bending over. Because yoga is not 45 minutes class. Yoga is not only on the mat. Yoga is off the mat. Every minute. Every moment, every karma, every thought, every action, every breath is yoga. Yoga is what you are. Life is wherever you are, every moment. It's not that tomorrow I will be happy. Maybe in the future, after 10 years, I will be okay, I'll be great, I will feel happy. This is the time, now. If you don't feel now happy, you will never be happy. Now is the time. You are the mantra. You are the mantra. We were on the edge of the Ganges in Haridwar and we had stopped by a, a cremation pyre. And uh, we asked if we could photograph. And I was trying to make images, not really knowing what I was doing. And somebody came over to me and sort of whispered that the man was watching his child be cremated. His son had died. I wrote about this photograph and said, a father watches his son being cremated at the side of the Ganges in Haridwar. The temple, quote unquote, body burns and releases the individual soul back into the universal soul. The saying from classic Buddhist lore is, I will give you a boat to cross the river, but you must leave it at the other side and continue on. The longer I'm involved in this journey, the more I realize that my yoga has evolved into a means of letting go and surrendering to change, passage, death, to move away from fear, to the fears that bind us. Why 
डरते हैं ये तो बहुत गहरा प्रसन्न है एक महात्मा जी गंगोत्री में रहते थे मृत्यु के लिए आए थे तो जब वो कहते हमने शरीर त्याग देना है शाम हो गई और गर्मी में उनको पता नहीं लगा रात होगी बर्फ गिरने लग गई जैसे तीन बजते हैं ये प्रैक्टिकल है कभी भी आप बैठ जाइए तीन बजे तक करा के धोना अपने आप ठंडा हो जाएगा अपने आप आपको लकड़ कितनी भी लगा लो इसमें जब रात हुई जब तीन बजते हैं तो वो क्या कहते हैं ये प्रश्न का तैराव को दे रहे हैं तो वो कहते हैं हे प्रभु आज का दिन हमें बचा दे क्या मतलब कहने का कि भय भय वाला शब्द है ना आपका तो एक तरफ तो हमें क्रोध भी चढ़ेगा तो हस्सा भी बड़ा है मेरे से फिर रहा नहीं गया दो ढाई बज रहे थे मैंने महात्मा जी से मैंने कहा महात्मा जी आप तो कह रहे थे मैं से चोला त्यागने आया हूँ और आप कह रहे प्रभु आज बचा लो क्या तो इतना भय होता है व्यक्ति को कि नहीं मैं जाना नहीं चाहता तो ये जो है ना भय ये तो वो ये भय हम और आप नहीं बता सकते जब वो समा आता है वो ही उसका वर्णन कर सकता है मौत से सभी ये प्राणी को ज्ञान ही नहीं होता कि हमने भी एक दिन मृत्यु हमारी भी होनी है ये तो भ्रम है मृत्यु लोक में मृत्यु लोक में और किसी चीज़ का भ्रम नहीं है इसी चीज़ का भ्रम है कि वो ये नहीं उसको ये नहीं ज्ञान होता है कि मेरी भी मृत्यु होनी है क्या वो सब संघर्ष करता है जो पहला प्रश्न था इनका वो प्रश्न का ये संघर्ष खूब करता है व्यक्ति लेकिन उसको ये नहीं पता लगता है कि ये मेरी भी एक दिन मृत्यु आएगी so this is the biggest misunderstanding in this life in our life is that we think that we will never die And they say that so many people leave their last breath like in a hospital and they use a swear word because they have done no preparation. We know this is temporary. We know we come to go. That's why you would do meditations out of the 10th gate preparing to go home. So you go home with ease, you go home with grace. But if you don't have that tool, you hold on for life. You don't want to leave. You in a coma for years. You have all this stuff. More, keep me alive. Put every tube you can in me. I have to stay alive because a lot of people think that this is it. At a certain stage, all the experiences begin to creep in, which are not pleasant. It brings up. Some deeper questions, because we begin to sense our mortality, or the sense that uh, we may one day end up be here. But as you go more inwardly, because for a while our experience experiences. Um, seem to be coming in from this side of the eyes, from the outside. But gradually, as we begin to discover more our inner being, we are finding that more it's coming into a field of peace and contentment and a wider perspective of life. The sense of choosing one's life becomes less important. The sense of living life becomes less important as you discover that you are life itself. 
it culminates in the end of this sense of separateness, of me and the world, of me and God, of me and truth. It's like the me gets merged into the greater, the greater consciousness. Then you can see from this place, because it is there already, it is what you are fundamentally. And this is the only space that there is in you that doesn't belong to time. Everything else is of time. Everything that you perceive is of time. Because this is the only place in you that's not coming in life. It is your eternal nature. If we really boil it down, fear is the fear of death. I mean, that's our big fear in life. I mean, we put a lot of other uh, points in front of it, but really it's fear of death. So once we master the fear of death, then we're free. So it is in this understanding of fear that we no longer have fear. You move forward. And when our time comes, we're ready. Because at that time, you can't go back. You're going forward and you're letting go of all fear and trusting what you've done all your life. So it is our opportunity to be free. I believe that's why we're here, is to learn that. So it's kind of funny. We're born to learn how to die. At the end of the day, we're all going to leave this planet or this body as we know it. But it's in those last breaths of our life that we, if we're in consciousness, that we can take that consciousness with us and move forward to our next journey. So look, death is scary. It's just as scary for me as it is for you, for all, for everybody. It's just simply the experience of being with yourself, of being with your breath. I mean, it isn't that it takes away the fear of death. It just makes sense of death. Because it's a moment of transition. If there is an energy and there is a spark and we believe in it, all we're leaving behind is a body. What's going to go with us is our experiences. time during the day to address those parts of us that we can't see. Um, we spend a lot of time taking care of our bodies and feeding our bodies and dealing with emails and the world around us and all the things that we can see and measure. And then we need some time to take care of those things or be with those things we can't see, like our breath or the feeling of quieting the mind or the feeling of um, maybe meditating on compassion or on contemplation on God, contemplation on consciousness, contemplation on love. All these things that we can't see and we can't measure. And so in the yoga practices and in meditation, that's a lot of the world that we're in. We're in the world of things that can't be measured. To be in that space 
without measuring stuff and trying to figure stuff out for a little while. Because there is no figuring it all out. We can only figure it out up to a certain point, and then the thing we figured out, well, it might change. Or there'll be something else to try to figure it out. That's where the idea of surrender comes in. To know the limits of how far we can get on our own steam, and at what point do we have to give up and have the faith or confidence that something else is going to help us along. There are a lot of people meditating, a lot of people doing something like yoga, a lot of people going to church. So there must be some drive in us, in all human beings, which lead us towards contemplating or praying or worshiping or being quiet in one way or another. Aristotle and Plato and the, you know, Jain monks and the yogis, they all questioned, they all contemplated. Some of them left society so they could contemplate these things. This has been going on for thousands of years. It's not new for us to be doing this. It's part of us to be doing this. I don't think that there really will be necessarily a better something, um, a better world, a more peaceful world. And it's not that I'm some kind of a fatalist or something, but it seems like there's always been a lot of violence in the world. There's always been political upheaval. There's always been financial problems and financial crises. Look to anywhere, there's always been something which has been either a famine, a scourge, a plague, a terrible king, overrun by foreign countries coming in and destroying everything. This has been going on for a long time, and we're no different. But there's always been some small groups of people who say, I don't want to take part in this kind of a way. And so I'm going to try to be a kinder person, a more thoughtful person. I'm gonna think about the world that I live in. I'm gonna think about my actions in the world. And I'm gonna try to be more loving. And there's always been some small groups of people throughout the ages and throughout time who have decided to do this. The yogis are one of those groups. And their longevity in terms of the practice staying alive has been remarkable. The practice of yoga might look a little bit different now, but the idea behind it is essentially the same. I don't want to take part in the world in the same way that I see it causing a lot of suffering to people. I want to take part in the world in such a way that it creates more happiness, more kindness, more thoughtfulness, more care. So we need that quiet time to experience those things. It just serves to make our life a little bit more stable um, and make our perception a little bit more clear and give us a greater appreciation that everyone around us is also going through that same struggle. In Tibet, 10 years ago, I was at Milarepa's cave and it was June, but there was a snowstorm blowing up the valley. His cave was at the top of a valley. And the group of people I was with went into the cave. But somehow, I walked away and I found a gigantic slab of stone, flat stone, perched at the top of the valley. And I sat and meditated in you know, in rain gear and cold weather gear while the snowflakes blew up the valley and tinkled on my clothing and in my eyes. 
And I sat there for an hour, and that meditation and whatever spirit was there and whatever aura was there, that's going with me when I go. No one can take that away from me. No one can take it away from you, your experiences. Oh. 